Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Diana Kim, and um, I am one of the members of the APOSTA Steering Committee. And I just want to welcome everyone for joining for this amazing session that um, we were able to bring for you all today. Um, I'm just uh, wanted to just go over a couple of housekeeping things before we we start. Um, just so you know, uh, we will be in just gallery view of our panelists, and we do have the chat box blocked off. Um, we will be taking some Q and A from the audience, so we hope you will utilize uh, the Q and A box for that portion. Um, once again, um, I just want to welcome everyone to the um, leadership panel here today. Um, in partnership with the Office of Diversity and Outreach, APASA um, is hosting this third annual AAPI leadership panel discussion. Uh, we wanted to celebrate and highlight um, some of the different AAPI leaders here at UCSF for May's AAPI Heritage Month. Um, we are hoping to give an opportunity for everyone here to listen from our, um, our leaders um, as they discuss their identity, their career trajectory, um, and AAPI workplace issues such as the bamboo ceiling. I'm so pleased um, to introduce William Ho, who is a UCSF medical and graduate student and is co-chair of the UCSF AAPI coalition, who will be our moderator today. Um, and before I hand it over to William, I just wanna um, just say thank you so much to our co-chairs of APASA, um, Rumpa, Yisen, and Tiffany Chan for helping with today's event. Um, it could not have been done with all of your help or support and everyone else on the steering committee. Um, and we hope you enjoy um, what the panelists have to say. So, William. Great, thank you, Diana, for the introduction. Um, and thank you for having me today to moderate today's panel. So I'll be introducing today's panelists, starting with May Christman. So as the Vice Dean for Administration and Finance at the UCSF School of Medicine, May Christman has served as head business officer for this school. Prior to coming to UCSF 19 years ago, she was a strategy consultant engaged in wide ranging industries, including assisted living facilities, household cleaning products, and amusement parks. Beyond her professional career, May's hobbies include photography, sourdough bread making, pottery, and raising chickens. Thank you, May, for joining us today. Our next panelist today is Clarice Estrada who has been the Executive Director for Finance and Administration in the Executive Vice Chancellor and Provost Office, where she specializes in operations management. She's been at UCSF for 21 years now. In her free time, Clarice is an avid volleyball player, participating in an adult volleyball league and coaching middle school volleyball. Her other hobbies include karaoke, shonen anime, and trying out new restaurants. Thank you for joining us today, Clarice. Our third panelist is Monica Gandhi who's a professor of medicine and holds many leadership roles in clinical practice, research, and medical training for infectious diseases. Since coming to UCSF for residency 27 years ago, her career has followed her love for the field of infectious diseases, working with vulnerable populations and the social justice aspects of HIV. Outside of her work, she is the mother to two teenage sons and has found profound importance in her Indian heritage and spirituality as a guide through difficulties in life. Our final panelist today is Tung Nguyen, who is Professor of Medicine and the Associate Vice Chancellor for Research and Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, and Anti-Racism. He joined UCSF 26 years ago. His career is notable for direct patient care, community-engaged research, and professional mentorship for A and HPI populations. He has also taken initiative in advocacy and government for the empowerment of A and HPI communities. Beyond his work, Ong is a musician, enjoys walking his dog, and is a longtime Warriors fan. Thank you, Tung, for joining us today. And once again, thank you to all of our panelists for taking the time out of your schedules to speak today. So our first question today really has to do with the idea of heritage, as it is Heritage Month. Um, and particularly, we were wondering if you could speak a little bit about how your heritage has shaped the person you've become today. So for this first question, I guess we can start with May. Would you be willing to talk a little bit about your heritage? Sure, thank you, William. Um, and thanks everyone for having me today. Uh, I have to say, um, I wish I were more China Chinese than I am. Um, so my parents are both from Taiwan um, and they met in the States in the 60s. They got married, raised a family here. Um, 
Taiwanese was actually my first language because my grandmother came over to take care of me while my parents worked. Um, and so that was my only language until my teacher in preschool urged my parents to stop talking to me in Taiwanese because it would mess up my English. Um, so that's one way um, that I wish I were more Chinese and just having the language and that connection to um, a big, large swaths of my family. Um, I would say that uh, I um, felt a really strong desire to fit in and to be as quote unquote American as possible. And so um, growing up, um, being Chinese wasn't really celebrated. I mean, my, my family uh, obviously had a lot of traditions, but it wasn't a public thing. And so it was really striking to me when I was a, a, an adult and my daughter came home from kindergarten after a Lunar New Year celebration. She, she came home and she just joyfully announced, I'm Chinese. And I, I thought, wow, that is something that I never experienced as a kid. Um, and so I feel like as an adult, I'm kind of playing a game of catch up. So um, there's a lot that I, I feel like I, um, you know, I, uh, my family has traditions, um, but they, they feel like, I, I feel like they, I've had a little bit of distance from that. And as an adult, I, I feel like I'm really trying to better um, embrace that history, spend more time talking with the older generation of my family, hearing their stories, writing them down, telling them to my kids. Um, so it's so, I, uh, so that's that's my um, that's my background. Oh, well, thank you, May, for sharing that. I mean, I think that what you shared is very relatable, especially to people in my generation, right? So I'm in the generation where my parents immigrated to the United States. My mom is also from Taiwan, so nice connection there. Um, but yeah, when I was growing up, and a lot of my peers also felt that, you know, our identity was quite stifled. You know, we were trying to fit in with their surrounding community, which was were largely not Asian identifying or a Asian guy in any way, um, and trying to reclaim our identity as we grow older. So I think this, this thread of, you know, feeling kind of out of place in the community you come to really reminds me a little bit about what I've known about home, you know, and coming from Vietnam to the United States and your experiences, I believe, you know, going to Pennsylvania, I believe you've written a little bit about that before. Would you be willing to talk a little bit more about your heritage? Thanks, William. Yeah, I, I came to the United States when I was 11 from Vietnam at the end of the war. So I came there's always a bit of a debate about whether or not I'm an immigrant, immigrant or a refugee. I think I'm both. Uh, and when I went to live in Pennsylvania, you know, uh, there was hardly any Asian there. As a matter of fact, I think I was one, the only Asian in my uh, middle school um, and learning how to speak English there. So very uh, keenly aware. Uh, I, I think, you know, that you can be Asian in a place where there are lots of white people and think you're white, <laughs> which is, I think, I, I have some friends who are like that. They grew up in Michigan and they're like, oh, I never thought I was Asian. And then you can be an Asian in a predominantly white place and feel like you're Asian because it's so different uh, that there's it's impossible not to feel that. And that's sort of on my side because um, I, I was in a very conservative white place that uh, they were nice people. They were not not nice, but it was very clear that I, I didn't really belong there. Um, and and for that, that pretty much shaped my whole life and work as as uh, as a person because I also watched my parents struggle. Uh, I was young enough to adapt, and I learned to speak English pretty quickly. Um, but my parents didn't, and for the rest of their lives, you know, they they learned a little bit of English, but they ended up mostly in enclaves. Um, they 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 lived in that place, and then I had to move away because I couldn't deal with it. So they found enclaves where they can be with other Vietnamese Americans. So. Uh, that really shaped the way I saw things. When I decided to become a doctor, partly because I saw my parents having such trouble accessing the healthcare system. So that that really drove a lot. And then once I became a doctor, I was just like seeing like, you know, uh, on the other side, like how hard it is for patients to get good health care. So that really shaped pretty much everything I've done since then. Um, so um, been, you know, I, I really ha have a good time talking to people about my identity because everyone's identity is very different. Um, but it's the struggle of figuring out what your identity is that actually makes it really interesting. So. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for sharing that. You know, I feel like what you're sharing there about your 
your struggles in growing up and watching the struggles your parents were going through and influencing how that made you choose your professional career actually does remind me a bit about what I've read about Monica and how your upbringing led you, you know, through journeys and knowing your friends to pursuing infectious diseases. But also, I think you've written a little bit before about how your Indian identity has really pervaded your entire career. Would you be willing to talk a little bit more about that? Oh, Monica, you're on mute. Um, thank you. So I was born and raised um, in the States, but in Utah. And I think that that matters um, because it was, um, this was in the, um, 70s and 80s so it was uh it was a very conservative state but it was also very importantly um very very white um and there were very few people of color of any type at all in my school it was myself my sister my brother and then a, a girl who was korean um who had been um adopted by two mormon parents um and so uh because of that uh my i felt like my entire identity was actually shaped as feeling like the other and I got really interested in HIV and I was only 12 when these first cases came out about HIV because it seemed very othering. It seemed like it was those who were different, those who were um, marginalized, stigmatized, gay, LGBTQ, all that was, was the identity of HIV. And it really drew me in. I wanted to work on HIV from a very young age because it felt like um, yeah, that's what it felt like to be in, in the other camp, actually. And then um, I also, uh, uh, the other thing that was really formative is I would go to India a lot when I was growing up. And that, see, just seeing the distinction between what happens in infectious disease in the context of poverty versus not being poor. Uh, I, I know this is true of all diseases, but infectious disease seems particularly egregious that a single pill for malaria is not affordable, um, you know, in a region and it's affordable in another. Just it just seemed like the disparity between rich and poor. Infectious disease really illustrated that disparity. So it was both going growing up, going to India, and then just feeling different that shaped my entire my entire career and my entire path. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. It seems that you really were motivated by a lot of the experiences you saw around you and have done wonderful things in your career since then with that motivation. Thank you. So, Clarice, I want to give you the opportunity to talk here. Please tell us a little bit more about yourself and your heritage. Of course. Well, it's, it's interesting about this group because we really do come from a lot of different um, backgrounds. And um, I identify as Filipina. Um, my parents were married in the States. They were, um, they were born in the Philippines and got married in Tennessee, of all places. Um, and I was born in San Diego. So I'm, um, I was born and raised in East Side San Jose and was only surrounded by people of color. So I didn't know anything else. <laughs> so literally my neighbor was um, Mexican. Across the street was our, our black neighbor. We had a Vietnamese one next to him, um, another Latino person. So I only knew um, being around uh, people of color. And um, so I think that was a huge uh you know, contributed to how, how my life was shaped. Um, the, the Philippines is a heterogeneous kind of country, um, you know, as a result of their colonization history. And so there is this kind of inherent acceptance or, you know, um, expectation of diversity. And, um, and then you just kind of go with it. You kind of, um, we kind of adapt and expect it to be honest. And so that's how my um, childhood was, is I expected everybody to look different. Um, and actually the white people were the minorities. There, there was maybe one or two in my, my class. Um, and so it's, it was, I grew up obviously very different from everybody else. And um, when I, my, my first kind of exposure to us being the, the minority um, was in college when I stepped into a classroom at UC San Diego and I said, whoa, I've never seen so many white people in my entire life. <laughs> um, but, you know, but I think, you know, Filipinos tend to understand themselves as a part of a group, and um, and you know they have that this sense of pride with their group. Um, we have and and really, the interests of the collective really overrides the the individual. And so I I feel like I've taken that in kind of my my career um, in, in my role today. It really is about gathering a group of people together to get one thing done. Um, and I, I feel like that um, 
that trait from my heritage really has, has gotten to me where I am today. Um, Filipinos really value hospitality and like interpersonal harmony <laughs> and all of these things, which I think naturally come from the way I approach things um, at UCSF. And so I, um, I think this sense of expecting a diverse community and then kind of these, these values that I um, have as, as a Filipina really have kind of shaped how I, I act today. Yeah, that's really wonderful. Thank you for sharing. I think it's just really great to see how today's panel really highlights how, you know, we all can come from very different walks of life with very different experiences in childhood even. You know, I know that we all don't do the same things here at UCSF, but we all have come to the same institution. I think that, you know, our goals are all ultimately the same in terms of promoting health equity and providing for the patients around here and around the world. Um, so Clarice, you were talking a little bit right there about how your heritage has influenced how you work with others, you know, working with a team. And I'm sure that's something that's very important as someone in leadership nowadays, as you're gathering your team and working towards the goals for the institution. Um, so I guess that would be a great time to talk about our next question, which is as a leader at UCSF, what can you tell us about the work that you're doing and what brings you the most meaning? Absolutely, happy to uh, chime in on that. And so my work, as, as you mentioned earlier, is really in operations management. I help the executive vice chancellor and provost um, with uh, running the finances, um, the administration space, um, HR, things of that nature. And really, you know, enabling um, our faculty, our trainees, our researchers, um, you know, to, to get what they need to do done. Um, and I think that really is yet another aspect of the, the Filipino heritage, which is how do we support each other? Um, there's this sense of um, the collective and how we all can, you know, do our little part to make the whole so much, so much better, right? And, um, and in EVCP, for example, we're not a specific school. We really are there to support the whole infrastructure, which is also um, why I feel like, um, you know, my background really uh, is, is a strength in this role, which is, um, you know, understanding the diversity of mission and needs of all the different schools and control points, and how do we work together to, to you know, to, to gain those types of things. Um, you know, as a manager, you know, like, I, I feel like it's, uh, you know, what also is very important to me is to ensure this sense of, di di or ensure diversification of thoughts. Um, and UCSF has been really great about that in the last couple of years. I mean, super being intentional about, do we have different people in the room, you know, and, and not necessarily worrying about the, the right um, people in the room. And, um, and I, I, you know, back to what I said earlier is you, you have such a, um, you know, a, an opportunity when you bring in different types of people. And, um, and I think that's what EVC is trying to do is, how do we bring in all of the different opinions so that we find a, a common solution? So I think um, that's that's what bring, brings me the most meaning um, in this role. And then um, I think uh, you know having this this expectation, as I mentioned earlier, of like of diversity and and cooperate cooperation really um, has kind of um, helped drive what how I approach my work in EVCP. Great, thank you for sharing. So I think, you know, you talked a little bit about how your role in EBCP transcends, you know, the individual apartments at UCSF, you're kind of bridging together everyone. Um, whereas, so I think that it would be really interesting to hear from May here, right, who works within one of those categories within the School of Medicine about how, about the work that you do, you know, on a, in a very important role, just kind of, with a different audience, right? More specific to the school as opposed to broad ranging. Uh, and if you could tell us about where you find meaning in your work. Sure. Well, I guess I would, I think um, we in the School of Medicine feel like we're everywhere. Um, but, um, uh, and, and I think that that actually has been what, what has been very appealing to me about working in the school. So um, you, you had noted that I, uh, came to UCSF 19 years ago, and uh, what attracted me initially was uh, 
the juxtaposition of just the world-class uh, patient care and education and research that we were doing compared with the horrible administrative processes that we had. Um, I remember being interviewed and just seeing the being told stories of the piece of paper that went from office to office to, be, to being signed. And so um, part of what brings me uh, me meaning, I'll, I'll say there are really two things. One is there's so much amazing work that's done here. And so whatever I can do to make it easier for that work to get done, uh, the better. And I felt like there was a lot of opportunity 19 years ago. And for better or worse, there's still a lot of opportunity. Um, and I, so I, I uh, do feel like, particularly given the nature of the bureau bureaucracy that is the University of California and all the different rules and things that need to be, that we need to pay attention to that um, being able to tra translate that in a most the most practical way um, so that people can do the jobs that they came here to do is meaningful to me. And I guess I would say the other thing uh, I mentioned there are two things that I really appreciate. The other thing is um, I like thinking about systematic solutions to things. And one of the things that um, we get to think about is where we direct resources to get to the right, uh, the outcomes that we desire as a collective. Um, and sometimes those resources are actually money. Um, some of the time, sometimes it's just um, policy. So, you know, for example, I guess building on what Clarice was saying about having the um, diverse voices at the table, just a simple thing like instituting a school of medicine policy that our dean did that required any kind of committee where substantive decisions were being made or any body where substantive decisions were being made had to have at least 50% uh, women or URM representation. It was just like a, a very um, perhaps overly simplistic mechanism, um, but actually very effective in just making that a, a conscious decision every time those kinds of um, uh, groups get formed. So it's, it's making those kinds of thinking, thinking about what, uh, what we can do to move the whole school and all of UCSF forward is what brings me joy. Yeah, well, I've only been at UCSF for two years, but I think that compared to what you were describing there from 19 years ago, I think you've done some great work in the time since then. Um, you know, I, I think what you were talking about there with resource allocation, you know, how do we make the most good with what we have in overcoming logistical hurdles? Um, you know, as a medical student, I can't think of something else other than like infectious diseases as a place where resource allocation is one of the big struggles that we face internationally, right? Um, where Monica talked earlier about how the availability of medications in different places is just absurd sometimes, right? About how we are really privileged in the United States to have access to some of these medicines, whereas in other places, you know, that is almost impossible. So Monica, could you tell us a little bit more about the work that you've been doing and how you've been finding more meaning in that? Yes, so, you know, it would, for me, um, and, and I see these questions coming in, which we'll talk about later, um, I actually never necessarily, um, thought that I was in, a, in, in an Asian group when I was growing up in Utah, because anyone who was of color whatsoever, um, which were so few, we banded together <laughs> because we were lonely. Um, and so there wasn't actually, there wasn't any ability, like Carice was describing in San Diego, to have Filipino groups or Vietnamese or Chinese or Indian. You would like to see someone from across the room, um, and you were just excited to have any diversity. And so um, that actually made me really interested later in even when I became more of a majority, because what happened is I went from Utah uh, and University of Utah to Harvard Medical School and then UCSF for residency. And I cannot say that Indian Americans are a minority in medicine. In fact, there's a concentration of Indian Americans in medicine. And so um, it was almost like it was it was there is this um, book which I would recommend called Race in America which is a very amazing documentary book about how it feels like every interaction is somehow being informed by your caller. And that's how I felt for the first 21 years of my life, because I also went to uh, college at my parents' uh, insistence uh, in Utah as well. And um, so everything was informed by 
your color. It really was like everything you were like, are you exoticizing me? Is this like, are, are you saying that I'm, you're surprised that I could do well in school because I'm so different? Like wh what is the implications of this statement? Like it was either unconscious bias or bias just out there. And then I went to medical school and residency in places that Indian Americans were in medical school and residency. And I never forgot what that felt like to go from kind of more of a minority position into more of a majority position. And that is why I became really interested in supporting diversity. And I don't mean just diversity of Asians, I mean, Black, Latino, um, Latina, um, uh, Vietnamese and Filipino, which are underrepresented Asian minorities actually, everything that has to do with the definition of NIH diversity, the traditionally underrepresented groups in research and in medicine. And so any position of power that I had at UCSF, I would use to try to, to uh, elevate people who are mostly underrepresented minorities, mostly Black and Latino, Latina in our, in our case. So I have three major uh, leadership roles. One is the director of the UCSF CFAR, Center for AIDS Research. And I um, not only am very interested in mentoring and mentoring around diversity and training people how to mentor more effectively for diverse early stage investigators, but we formed an unrepresented minority diversity program specifically for, for the handful, unfortunately, handful of underrepresented minorities who work in HIV research to support them at every step of the way. And then in my role as medical director of Ward 86, which is an HIV clinic, we're always trying to think of how to support people differently. For example, a Spanish speaking only clinic called the Salud Clinic um, for Latino, Latina patients or a black health program. And then in my role as associate program director for the um, ID fellowship, I'm always trying to increase DEI in our, in our the people who we choose. And I'll tell you, I've had major arguments with people on calls where they're like, but look, if you're looking at the, at the, um, at the uh, resume, this looks like a better resume. And then I'll say, but, but what about the distance traveled to even get to this place? Um, and, and, and it's, it's trying to use any influence that I can have as I get into leadership roles to help with our DEI initiatives at UCSF, because I, it's not just being Asian. For me, it was everything. It was just being of color in the United States and what that felt like when I grew up in a really, really white state. Yeah, thank you for sharing that, Monica. I think you really touched on a very, very important thread here. Um, you know, where unfortunately, sometimes it seems that advocating for AA and HPI communities can, if not done very carefully and with purpose, you know, seem very isolating in a sense where we ignore the struggles of other people who have been othered, you know, largely a black indigenous and people of color, right? Um, where we see, you know, you, you went to Harvard Medical School, I went to Harvard College. When I was at Harvard, uh, there was a lawsuit and I think there still is a law school, a lawsuit about, you know, largely pitting A and HPI communities against, you know, others who have been really struggling because of historical factors largely. Um, and it's important for us to maintain that we are here, we are gonna work by our values and you know, it's not just about us, it's about everyone here. Um, so I think some of the themes that you brought up there are really related to what the work Ong has done uh, here at UCSF, but also really nationally, right? Um, in your roles in government, working with President Obama um, and also empowering right, through, I believe, the AAPI Victory Alliance, which from what I've seen in their newsletters is really in this theme of unity, right? And it's not just about us, it's about supporting us, supporting other communities, and they will in turn support us when we need them. So Tung, would you be willing to talk about that? Yeah, I, I want to say that sometimes when we talk about our careers, I, I'm always amazed like how some people kind of plan it. <laughs> like, they, they, oh, okay, this is what I wanted to do. I have to tell you, when I finished medical school, I was like, what the heck am I going to do? I'm like, I, I, I wanted to be a doctor, but, you know, I don't know anything after that. Like my, I don't have anybody who's doctor. I don't know anybody who does any of this stuff. Um, and, and, and so what I wanted to say was that, you know, where I ended up now uh, is driven by a couple of things. Uh, the first thing that's driven by is the care for the patient. Um, 
uh, every time I take care of a patient with a problem, I try to solve their problem. And I just keep pulling at that thread, like, and I would stop, I would not stop pulling at the thread until I figure out what's going on, right? So it started out with Vietnamese patients. And then, you know, well, you know, they have all these language problems, they have all these things and go on the community and where's the data? You know, how do you solve the problem without the data? Well, there's no data. So I became a researcher uh, to generate data, right? Um, and then the more you work with patients, you realize patients are only patients a short amount of time. Most of the time they are not patients. They're actually in the community living their lives. So their lives are, and, and their health is really affected by all these things that's happening out in the society. Uh, and so that's sort of where I started taking my career path to, into research into these different kinds of areas. But once you start doing that, you can't stop staying in your silo. So even though I started out working with Vietnamese and I ran a group called the Vietnamese Community Health Promotion Project here at UCSF, it became very clear that you can't solve the problem of the Vietnamese Americans without thinking about Asian Americans, let's say. So I became more interested in doing Asian American work. And then as I do Asian American work, it becomes very clear that you can't solve the problem of Asian Americans if you only look at Asian Americans, you know, and you get involved with Native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders, and then other people of color. And so I, I think, you know, if we, you know, I, I just feel like I can't, even though I, what started me on this path is caring about Vietnamese American, for me to do um, the right thing for that group, but also for everyone, I end up working on diversity issues, uh, generally speaking. And when you work on diversity issue in this country, you gotta be you gotta be pushy, and you gotta be advocating because obviously, in a white centered um, society and white centered system, uh, in order for you to get what your your, your people broadly defined need, you have to advocate. Uh, you have to empower. You have to engage. You have to organize, you have to build coalitions. And that's pretty much where I am now. You know, I went from leading a Vietnamese group uh, to creating the Asian American Research Center on Health, so that expanding that group, and then went from that to working on now in my position as Associate Vice Chancellor, looking at diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism for all groups. Um, so my main thing about being AA and HPI is we should be very proud of our heritage. Uh, but if we really care about our uh, community and doing the best we can for our community, it can't just be only for our community. <laughs> it is not going to work. Um, uh, I, I will say that, you know, this is a classic, you know, we, we, we know about the Asian American minority myth, right? The, the Asian American minority myth is that we are better than other minority groups, right? We are somehow inherently better. But it wasn't Asian Americans who came up with that idea. Right. It wasn't. Um, it was white people who came up with that idea. And the reason why they came up with that idea was to put us in opposition to other minority groups during the civil rights movement. Uh, and so uh, this idea of um, honoring ourselves and our heritage is great on the one hand, but we also need to see, you know, how do we promote that heritage? How do we go forward with that? Do we do that by ourselves or do we do that in coalition with others? Yeah, thank you there for speaking a lot about, you know, very, very important ideas. Uh, I believe that there was a recent news article out in the Chronicle that was quite related to that topic here. Um, you know, our next question, I think, really does tie into the thread of your answer right there, which was about how you kind of built your career for yourself, right? Starting with that first passion for the individual patient, right? And how continuously you learned to broaden what you needed to work on until you're at the point where you are now, um, you know, in leadership as an associate vice chancellor, right? It were earlier in today's panel or in the introduction, the bamboo ceiling was alluded to. Um, and we know that we're very fortunate at UCSF to have a robust A and HPI workforce. But what we do see in the data is that as you ascend the leadership hierarchy, the proportion of people who identify as A and HPI does decline, uh, which is you know, what we do refer to as the bamboo ceiling. So we, one of the questions that I've been asked to ask you all has to do with, from your perspective, as people who are in leadership, right, who have broke the bamboo ceiling for yourselves, what advice do you have for our attendees who Want, who might want to be in leadership themselves at some later stage in their career. Uh, and Tone, since you're the one who made me think about asking this question now, would you be willing to speak first? 
Yeah, thanks. This is a hard one. First of all, yes, there's a bamboo ceiling everywhere in this country and, and certainly at UCSF. Uh, I also want to raise the idea that there's a bamboo and glass ceiling too. So for Asian women, uh, age API women in particular, they're dealing with a double whammy. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. Uh, it exists. Um, it exists not necessarily because of individuals, but it exists structurally, right? Like it's just the way things are set up. Um, uh, I, I can't say that my experience is uh, going to be, you know, great for anyone else to follow. Everyone takes their own path through this. But but I think, you know, developing your own excellence in whatever it is that you do that you're passionate about is really the first most important thing. You have to be really good at what you do if you want to progress. And then you have to build coalitions and partnerships in, in sort of addressing the structural things. That's kind of my, my simple way of thinking about the world is there are the things I can do that I want to do really well. But I can't solve the problems of the world by myself. I have to solve my, the problems with other people. And that's how I sort of advance forward is I built my expertise in my work, which is taking care of patients and doing research with Asian Americans, and then started using that as the launching pad for where I started conversing with other people uh, who are interested in similar things like health inequities and so on and so forth. And in those conversations, as they come up, opportunities come up, right? Uh, and, you know, how how much you want to take on sort of is a work-life balance issue. I took on a lot. I had three kids I was raising um, uh, in on, on top of, you know, trying to have an academic career in a world where um, Asian American researchers is completely underfunded. There are studies that show that uh, both Black and Asian American researchers don't get funded to the level they should be funded by the NIH. So I was struggling with all this stuff uh, and had to make some choices along the way as to how... I was going to maintain it with my career. And, and, and the way I did that was just by collaborating with people and sort of understanding that um, I came to a pretty early realization that if I did Vietnamese work alone, I was going to get, not going to get anywhere as a leader because, you know, why would they promote me if there's no Vietnamese leader of UCSF position, right? I mean, that just doesn't make any sense, right? You know, we could, we should maybe have a Vietnamese leader of UCSF, but we're not there. So I have to start thinking about like, how does my work build up to a bigger um, sort of a leadership position that can take care of other things. So. Great, thank you for sharing that. And yeah, I mean, as you mentioned there, we all have our individual journeys. And you know, while I know you mentioned that the generalization of your experience may not necessarily apply to everyone in how they can challenge the bamboo ceiling, um, it's, I think it is very helpful to have you share your experience there. Um, so maybe May, would you like to talk about any advice that you have? Yeah, sure. I guess um, uh, actually Tung said something that resonated with me. I have to say, I personally do not feel like I have experienced the bamboo ceiling, but I feel like I've, so I've never felt like I have um, been treated differently because I was Asian, but I would say that um, I've, felt uh, um, that I, the, um, the glass ceiling. So I feel like I identify more as a working mother uh, and as a um, person who's not very uh, physically dominating um, as something that, uh, that, does, that has affected me at work. Um, and I guess, I mean, I think that, so, I would say um, at UCSF, there's a lot of focus right now with this with Gallup and this this tool called Strengths Finder with the philosophy of lean into your strengths, like focus less on your weaknesses. And I have to say, I don't fully buy into that. I think that to be really successful, you have you should lean into your strengths and be recognized for that. But I feel like you also have to lean a little bit into your weaknesses. And so this is not a what I'm thinking about is not specific to the bamboo ceiling, but really just in in um, progressing in your career and pro progressing at UCSF is just, um, you know, do good work um, and don't just do the good work, but find look for opportunities to improve the work and kind of sh share your creativity and your drive that way. Um, and I would say also find a champion. Um, I think it's really, uh, I think, at UCSF, there's you know a model for mentorship, but it's fairly informal. Um, but I think it's critical. Uh, and when I look at the people that uh, that I've been surrounded with, 
at UCSF. It's that there are a lot of people that are, are interested in lifting others up. Um, and so I, I think it's really helpful to um, just put yourself out there and make those connections. Um, not all of them will stick, um, but I think that that, that um, make, making those connections and sharing your mindset, sharing how you think about um, uh, working hard and improving your work, I think goes a long way. Yeah, well, thank you, May, for sharing. I think what you brought on there, you know, really emphasizes how the support networks we have, the mentorship we have, really, it, it does help us with all sorts of ceilings, right? Whether it's glass or bamboo, uh, and how, you know, building senses of community where you're supported, where we, where you feel like you want to support others is extremely important. I think that since coming to UCSF, that's something that I really appreciated here. You know, you mentioned earlier about how, I guess you didn't necessarily feel the bamboo ceiling as strongly as the glass ceiling. And I wonder really about how much, you know, one's upbringing and where they grew up and how they were perceived comes into play there. And so Clarice, I know that earlier you were talking about you grew up in San Diego, you had quite a different experience, right? Compared to some of our other panels who grew up in like Utah and Pennsylvania, uh, very different places and how that might have impacted your journey with regards to the bamboo ceiling if you encountered it. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, I was born in San Diego and ended up moving to Eastside San Jose, where is kind of where I was surrounded by this, you know, beautiful um, neighborhood with people of color. And I think, um, you know, one of these uh, contributors to this bamboo ceiling, what is kind of um, what Tung was saying regarding the, you know, the model minority. So people, make this this automatic assumption that they don't that our group doesn't need any advocacy or sponsorship. And so I think that that is part of getting to the leadership role is you really do need it as may you know clearly articulated support for and, and advocacy and you know mentors to get to that to that level. And so I think um, that persona of kind of being the you know the invisible um, you know minority group kind of contributes to that um, bamboo ceiling issue. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, this also, you know, perceived misconception of what does a successful leader look like, right? We have the, the white male view of what a successful leadership, which doesn't quite match the, you know, the Asian persona, which, you know, as a result of a lot of our culture's values of humility, there's more of this quiet and reserved and more, you know, um, you know, passive kind of approach to things at sometimes. And, and so I think, we ourselves don't think of us in that leadership role. And so my advice, you know, to your question, William, is for all of you on the call to really think about, we don't need to be the loud, aggressive, assertive leader. We need all kinds of leaders. And as I mentioned earlier, UCSF is open to that. Thank you, UCSF. Um, because, you know, as, as Tung said, you know, I, I would have never imagined myself in this role, to be honest, right? Um, but what I did do is throw my hat in the ring you know, to see if my skills alone and not kind of what I assumed um, people were expecting, you know, is sufficient to, to filling the role. And lo and behold, here I am talking to all of you guys. So, so I think uh, my advice to all of you on the call is, um, you know, don't, don't make assumptions what you think they need. You know, what you, what you should do is know what you want. And if you, you know, um, have the skill set, throw your hat in the ring. Um, and then for us who are in these leadership roles, I got a lot of, let me tell you what you should do, um, <laughs> is, you know, there aren't a lot of us in the, in the leadership roles. And so it is really our duty to sponsor, um, you know, our Asian American colleagues. And, you know, as, as Tung said, everybody, um, you know, if, if people of color into these roles, because without us saying something, it, it ain't going to happen. You know, it, what May, May was saying earlier, very little, you know, seems super straightforward effort, like, you know, putting in a, a standard for how committees should be. You know, it, it doesn't take that much for us to kind of move the needle. And yes, the needle takes a while to move. But, but I think that's, uh, I think some contributors and the advice I would give to folks um, looking to uh, moving into leadership is, um, you know, you are a leader, you know, even though you don't look like the one that they show on TV or the one that everybody else has decided um, a leader looks like. I, I think you are, and you bring a, a special set of values because of the place that you came from um, or the background that you came from. And um, I think you should, uh, and then the rest of us have a responsibility for advocacy and allyship to get those folks in those positions. 
Can I chime in on something that Clarice said that really struck me? I mean, I, I tend to not give individual advices because it's so different. And I always think more about structural problems rather than putting mm -hmm. it on the onus on the individual. But what Clarice says about, you know, throwing your hat in the ring is really important. I mean, you're not going to get any job you don't apply for. <laughs> so so, so the main thing here is, I also will say one thing, which is kind of sad. My number of rejections outweighed my numbers of successes, my, my acceptances by, by many factors. In other words, I fail at many applications to move upward before I got a couple. And you only need to get one. So please do try if that's what you want. Yeah, I have to say, I totally, uh, Clarice's comment totally resonated, resonated with me. Just manifest, see yourself in these roles, and then talk to people and figure out how to get there. Yeah, well, I think that's really great. Uh, Monica, I mean, you have yes. had quite your spotlight in the leadership, or as a leader, not only at UCSF, but also in the community, especially as an infectious diseases doctor. Um, do you have any advice? from your perspective? Um, so, you know, I would say there is something um, about being a woman and being a color that, um, and it doesn't matter what color you are, I think there's just, there is, there is something that people don't even mean to do, like in terms of unconscious bias. There's just more like, I was, uh, I did a lot of COVID messaging um, and there was just more, many more attacks on people who were Asian and there were on that there were kind of like three people talking a lot about COVID from from the Department of Medicine and and the, the white person didn't, just, just didn't get attacked as much and I'm just not sure why I mean I think I know why but it's just it, it's it's just unconscious bias it's just I don't think people even know what they're doing mean to that's actually the point of unconscious bias is that if you bring it forward that people can acknowledge it and then they start they stop thinking that that they, 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 they. It, it's very important to bring it forward, and that's like implicit association um, training and figuring out what did we do just growing up here that led to all these unconscious biases. Um, so yes, I, I, I would of course I would agree. Like apply for anything, but I think just work really hard. Like that's kind of how people kind of keep their head down and they work really hard, and then and then your accomplishments on paper. And get you the job um and and it's not it shouldn't be i hope i hope the unconscious bias doesn't come into play and if it does and it and sometimes it does it's it's our work it's our job as leaders to to work on people's implicit bias and and um and and bring it to the to the light so that it gets dropped because that actually there is ways to train people out of their unconscious bias we all have it we were just raised here we we were raised seeing things on tv and this was the leader, this wasn't. So this woman was doing this and this man was doing this. And that, that's just what happened to us. It's it's nothing, it's no one's fault, but we have to we have to work on it to drop the bias. Okay. Well, thank you all for answering all of these questions. Uh, it's it's time to move on to the QA. And I think there's a really good question in here. It's actually been echoed. Um, and so this question has to relate to. So the question that was asked relates to DEIAR at UCSF in particular, but I'm going to want to expand it beyond, and we touched a little bit about this before, to you know, A and HPI society in general, um, which is, so the question has to do with the focus of DEIAR initiatives. Um, and the attendee is asking about whether it feels that here at UCSF, uh, the A and HPI population seem to be a little bit less of the focus um, of those initiatives compared to people who identify as black and brown, even though here in San Francisco, people who do identify as A and HPI are well represented. Uh, so, the, so the question, I guess, is about representation versus you know, the actual experience, right? Microaggressions, all of these small things that we experience. Uh, and I, I want to tie this into another question also which is about how in society, it seems that people are trying to treat A and HPI individuals as more white adjacent, um, as opposed to just you know, having our distinct identity. So you know, the, I know that this has been a lot and it's a very heavy question in many senses, um, but your comments on you know, your thoughts about how we can better improve our sense of who we are and 
how we can best utilize organizational resources towards improving equity um, and you know not just seeing like we are the silent minority here. And Tony, it looks like you unmuted. So yeah, can I take a crack? Because this is a, a real struggle for me uh, uh, in both directions. Um, I think we have to separate the issues around representation in several different ways. Uh, one is right sizing representation, and the other is having representation at all, right? So I think you know if you look at DIA activities at UCSF, many many Asian Americans are involved in it. So I have to say it's whatever your perception is. I mean, the committees that I run, tons of you know, lots of Asians. In other words, we are engaged in the conversation. When we look at metrics and things like that, I think it's fair to ask the question, where is the underrepresentation happening, right? So for Asian American here at UCSF, it's always been you know, very clear that leadership uh, or mid-level going all the way up is where the problem is. It's not at the entry level, right? So, so, and I think it's fine when you're trying to solve problems to be very deliberate about that. Like if this is where the problem is to try to solve a problem there. So I don't think, you know, what we don't want to do is conflate the two, like, oh, Asian Americans are not underrepresented. No, that's not true. Asian Americans are not underrepresented here. They are underrepresented here, right? So let's just be clear about that. Uh, but we should be a part of the process no matter what. So that that's those are the two things I really want to say. I also want to say that when we always... I always get nervous when we say this group and that group and not think about the other group <laughs> because framing the question, this is exactly what you were mentioning uh, with the affirmative action lawsuit at Harvard and other places, is that when you go, is it Asian versus other people of color or is it Asian and other people of color versus white? <laughs> because when you're having that, that conversation, how you approach that conversation changes the solutions you come up with. Uh, and 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 also who you ally yourself with, uh, which says a lot about us. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Does that, do any of the other panelists want to comment on this question? I mean, I would say what I said before, which is that I think that once everyone on this call is in a position of leadership, and if you're in a position of leadership, you can use your platform to advocate for um inclusion for it's it's for not just inclusion of your group because that's the entire point like we should all be advocating for all groups and in fact that's what happened in the hiv movement it was never like when people were fighting for antiretroviral access worldwide it was never just about their group it wasn't just about gay men or women who had it or trans patients who had it like everyone sort of worked together and brought everyone in and I compare it to that, that, that we should be bringing everyone in. We should be not just advocating, um, you know, that, that case at Harvard is a very important case about admissions, that, um, that my children may not be as, um, uh, as Indian Americans may not be, um, you know, may, may have some sort of ceiling into getting into these schools. And yet it is our, um, it's actually our duty, right, like to bring everyone up so i would say uh try not to 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 get into your to your little groups where we were supposed to <laughs> like i'll just remind you of utah we were all in it together <laughs> great thank you monica um mayor clarice do you want to comment on this it's okay if you don't i don't think i have any though anything else to add you know i think um you know tongue's point about the data focusing us on what the real questions are is very helpful. And then, you know, as, as Monica said, kind of um, we do this together. It's more impactful that way and probably more effective, to, you know. So I um, don't think I can add anything else. I will say one thing, though. Sorry, May, if you want to say something, but uh, I do want to acknowledge the, the, the position where that question is coming from, that we feel, many of us Asian Americans feel excluded here when the conversation is about minorities. Okay, it's not about underrepresented minority. Like we're in this weird place where we're a minority, but we're not. Like we're being treated like a minority when it suits them, and we are treated like not a minority when it suits them, right? So, so it's be very. It's important to think the word about the word underrepresented minorities and the word minorities very distinctly. And I don't think this place does a good job of that. Okay, so 
Um, I'm an Asian American. I may not be underrepresented, but I'm definitely a minority. You can't take that away from me. I have to suffer for it. So why are you taking that away from me, right? So I just want to make sure that we do acknowledge that there are micro and macro aggressions that are happening to Asian Americans, even in the best contention world where people are trying to raise the level of everyone. So just want to acknowledge that. Fantastic. Thank you. All right. So it is 1259 and we do end at one o'clock. So I, I want to bring it to a close if that's okay with our panelists here today. Um, but so first of all, thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us today um, and taking the time out of your days to listen to our panelists speak. And of course, a huge thank you to all of our panelists for coming here uh, and, and speaking on a lot of things about your stories, you know, giving some advice, your perspectives on things here at UC, UCSF and also broadly in society. Um, you know, I wanna thank the Apostle Steering Committee once again for planning today's panel and for inviting me to moderate it. It's been a great pleasure. Um, and of course, thank you also to the Office of Diversity and Outreach for partnering with Apasa and bringing this panel to you all today. Um, for those of you who have friends who might want to view the, the event later, um, the recording will be made available. And although May isn't quite over yet, um, there are a few more events for Heritage Month coming up. So this week on Wednesday, please, can join, please consider joining uh, the AANHPI Coalition uh, for the status of AANHPI's at UCSF event. It's a discussion with leadership that will be touching on a lot of issues that we brought up today um, relating to workforce and patient experience uh, here at UCSF. And for those of you who work at the children's hospitals, there will be lion dancers performing on Friday. So hopefully that'll be a lot of fun if you're around. Um, more of a good information on that is on the link that Tiffany Chan just posted in the chat. So please feel free to check those out. And once again, thank you all for joining us. <laughs>